So that's it. Now that we've gotten through the classification of equilibria in continuous time, in discrete time, let's step back for a second and talk about the issue of stability. If we think about whether equilibria are stable or unstable, it was pretty easy back when we were doing one-dimensional dynamics. Now in 2D, it's maybe not as simple. Some things are clear. If I have a sink in 2D, that is definitely a stable equilibrium, whether it's a spiral sink or a regular sink. Likewise, if I have a source, there's no way we're not going to call that unstable. It's definitely unstable. But now we have a few new types available to us. What about a center? Is that stable or unstable? Well, if I pick a typical initial condition, I don't converge to the equilibrium. So I would say it's not stable. Then again, I'm not diverging off to infinity. So I think it's not unstable. It's sort of in between. And what about a saddle? A saddle has sort of half stable, half unstable behavior, right? I've got one eigendirection where I'm coming in, one eigendirection where I'm going out. But if I think in terms of, again, the typical initial condition, then what happens? I'm rushing away from that equilibrium. Almost everything is being controlled or dominated by what is happening along that unstable direction. Saddles are definitely unstable equilibria. And this observation leads us to the idea that instead of trying to worry about this type of equilibrium or that type of equilibrium, let's classify stability of individual eigenvalues. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about stable eigenvalues or unstable eigenvalues or the neutral, that's a good word, a degenerate, also good, the things that are on the boundary between stable and unstable. Now, as in 1D, this manifests itself differently depending on whether you're working in continuous or discrete time. So just like in 1D, in continuous time, we have a stable eigenvector if lambda is less than zero, but we have to be really careful. It's the real part of lambda that matters because now in 2D, we can have complex conjugate pairs. In discrete time, back in 1D, we said, uh, what? The absolute value of lambda is less than one. And we've got the same notation, but now we have to interpret that absolute value sign as the modulus of lambda so that if lambda is a complex eigenvalue, what we care about is its modulus being less than one. That's what makes it stable. To have an unstable eigenvalue, what do we have? In continuous time, the real part is positive. In discrete time, the modulus is bigger than one. And the degenerate eigenvalues, or the neutral eigenvalues, are going to be those on the boundaries between these stable and unstable regions. That is, the real part of lambda is zero, continuous time, or the modulus of lambda is one, discrete time. Now notice the similarity to 1D that's going on here, but it's a little bit different. And now with that in hand, we can discuss what it means to classify equilibria as stable or unstable. And the way we're going to do that is by the dominant eigenvalue. Just as in the case of a saddle, the dominant eigenvalue is what really matters. So we're going to say that an equilibrium is stable if all of its eigenvalues are stable eigenvalues, like a sink or a spiral sink, one of those guys. We're going to say that it's unstable if any of its eigenvalues are unstable. So that comprises sources, spiral sources, saddles, things like that. We're going to say that it's degenerate otherwise. Now, you've got to be a little bit careful here. Note the language. A stable equilibrium has all eigenvalues stable. If any of the eigenvalues are unstable, then it is an unstable equilibrium. Even if the other remaining eigenvalue is something like uh, degenerate or stable, something like that. One unstable eigenvalue makes it an unstable equilibrium. So be careful with your logic. Be careful with your terminology. 
Now, there's one remaining issue, and that is why? Why does the stability criterion look different between continuous and discrete time? This is a question that we asked back in 1D, and we gave a hint to it based on the exponential lemma that the shift operator E is the exponential of the differentiation operator D. That relationship between the evolution operators in continuous and discrete time reflects the stability criteria in those two domains. And now we can really see it because now that we're in 2D, our eigenvalues rightly lie in the complex plane. So if we draw a picture of the complex plane and look at the regions of stability for a continuous time dynamical system. So we have stable eigenvalues on the left-hand side of the plane, unstable eigenvalues on the right-hand side of the plane, neutral eigenvalues along the imaginary axis. Now what happens when we exponentiate that, when we apply the complex exponential? Well, using Euler's formula, we can easily see what these regions map to. And what they map to is this, the imaginary axis, maps to the unit circle. That's straight out of Euler. The left-hand side of the complex plane exponentiates to give you all of the complex numbers with modulus less than one. That's the interior of that disk. The right-hand side, the unstable portion of the continuous time complex plane maps to the region outside the unit disk. That is the region of unstable eigenvalues in discrete time. That's a beautiful picture that really explains why there's a difference in stability criteria between discrete and continuous time. It all goes back to eigenvalues, it all goes back to Euler, and it all goes back to the exponential lemma.